Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the development and training you're giving your servants and ministers. We're asking, Lord, tonight you speak to every heart. I will pray, Lord, your word will penetrate every heart in Jesus' name. Make us productive. Make us well developed. That your work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shout. Amen. We're coming to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading to you from verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're reading from verse 2. And it says that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Look at verse 15. Study. To show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly, properly, dividing the word of truth. Look at verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. That word apt there means having the aptitude to teach and is also patient in first thessalonians chapter 5 i read from verse 21 first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 21 prove all things hold fast that which is good as you study the scriptures as you learn from the scriptures as to prepare messages to reach the people of God, prove all things. As to read commentaries, as to listen to other people teach or preach or proclaim the word, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Job chapter 12. Reading from verses 11 and 12. Job chapter 12, 11 and 12. Does not the ear try words, and the mouth taste is meat? It says, as you taste the food you eat, so the ear shall try the words we hear. With the ancient is wisdom, and in length of days understanding. First Corinthians chapter 14. In First Corinthians chapter 14, we're looking at verse 20. First Corinthians chapter 14. Reading from verse 20, brethren. Be not children in understanding. That is, as we study the word, as we learn the word, as we are developed every week, and we come for the training every Saturday, it says it's to make us grow up. It's to make us grow up with the word of God and be not children, babies, toddlers, in understanding how be it in malice, be ye children. When it comes to offense against one another, be like children that will say, I won't play with you anymore. And then the very next moment, they're laughing and they're happy and they're in fellowship with each other. As children, our temper, our character, our behavior, our fellowship, our interaction, something happens, forget it and go your way. And go along with other people, but in understanding the men, in understanding, understanding the word of God, understanding the doctrine of the Bible, 
understanding what we teach, be men. Tonight, I'm talking to you on strategically developing and reproducing effective, fruitful ministers. Strategically developing and reproducing effective, fruitful ministers. Before I do that, before I go into the real message, I need to make some clarification on what we have learned now for three weeks concerning Mordecai. We need to have an understanding so that we know here is what the Bible teaches, here is what the Word of God says, and this is why he did what he did. Learning to be faithful and approved of God demands clarification on some peculiar actions in line with God's commandments. We need to have some clarification on Mordecai's firm stand as revealed in the scriptures. Not what commentaries say, not what we have heard other people say, we ourselves should have understanding. You understand? The stand of Mordecai was actually built on three areas of action. We're coming to Esther, chapter 3, verses 2, 3, and 4. Esther, chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 2. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed, underline that word, and reverenced, underline that word, Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, underline that, nor did him reverence, underline that. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate search unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, when he spake daily unto him, he hearkened not unto them that told, they told him and to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand. For he had told them that he was a Jew. Underline that. Why don't you bow? Why don't you do reverence to this man? I am a Jew. Look at chapter 3, chapter 5, verse 9. In chapter 5, verse 9, Then Haman went, Haman for, went forth, that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up. That's the three, that's the third point, that he stood not up, nor moved for him. He was full of indignation against Mordecai. The question is. Since he said, I am a Jew, was it forbidden by God that a Jew will not bow to anyone, will not do reverence to anyone, will not stand up for anyone? Not really, not really. Was it idolatry, worshipping idol, to bow down to a person? or to do reverence to a person, or to stand up when an elderly person comes in. Not really. And so we're going to look at the pattern of the Jews, the commandments for the Jews, and the practice between the Jews. We need this clarification because what I've been hearing from teachers and do so answer questions is that because of Exodus chapter 20 that you will not bow down to an idol that's why Mordecai took his stand he wasn't going to bow to Haman 
not really, not really. Number one, Jews bowed before their superior. Jews bowed before their superior. We're looking at First Samuel chapter 24. For Samuel chapter 24, I'm reading here from verse 8. In First Samuel chapter 24, verse 8, David also arose up to watch and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. If it was wrong, if it was worshipping somebody, David should not have bowed to Saul. You know the story and you know the situation between them. Bowing to a person in the Jewish practice was not idolatry. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, 2 Samuel chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 19. And David, according to the saying of God, went up as the Lord commanded. And around and looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arauna went out and, tell me, bowed himself before the king on his face to the ground. We're looking at First Kings chapter 1. First Kings chapter 1, verse 23. In First Kings chapter 1, verse 23, it tells us, And he told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan. Who is Nathan? Tell me out loud. The prophet. Behold, Nathan the prophet. And when he was come in before the king, what did he do? He bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. Chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 19. Bathsheba therefore went unto King Solomon. That's the mother going to the son Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her. And what did he do to the mother? bowed himself unto her and sat down on his throne. The throne was there. He was sitting on the throne. The mother came in. He stood up and he bowed to the mother. And then he says, he had a costly seat to be set for the king's mother, mother, and she sat on the right hand. So number one, it wasn't wrong for a Jewish person to bow to a superior. So you cannot say, I'm following Mordecai. You don't understand Mordecai. He said, I am a Jew and so I'm a Christian and I never bow to anyone because that is worshiping I don't. No, not really. Number two, he did no reverence to Haman. And even though the threat was there, that Haman got angry, I'm going to destroy this man, and I'm going to destroy all the Jews, Mordecai was still firm in his stand. Why was he firm? Somebody said, because if you do reverence to anyone, you are worshipping that person like God. And if Haman made himself God, we have to resist him. And if anybody makes himself God, how do we know they make themselves God? We must not reverence. The Jews actually reverenced their seniors. Look at Second Samuel, 
chapter 9, 2 Samuel chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 6. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and, what? I can't hear you. You don't want to learn the word of God, you're looking at time. Tell me, did reverence and David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Mephibosheth looked at David as a senior, a king, and he was just a little fellow, and so he did reverence. We're coming to First Kings chapter 1, verse 31 rightly dividing the word of truth first kings chapter one i read from verse 31 then bathsheba who was bathsheba the wife of who tell me wife of david the king but look at verse 31 then bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did what did she do reverence to the king and the king and and said let my lord king david live forever the wife did reverence to david is that idolatry no not at all it's the normal thing with the jewish people when they saw the elderly now let's come to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 12. We're reading from verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, our biological fathers, which corrected us, and we gave them, tell me, reverence. It's the normal thing. We reverence appearance. We reverence the seniors, the elders. And then it goes on to say, and we give them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Let's come to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 33. It says in verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And read the rest of that verse aloud. You read that again, one, two, three, go. Read that for the final time, one, two, three, go. And the wife see that she reverends her husband. Not idolatry, not at all. To bow before an elder, to reverence, respect, honor before an elder, not idolatry. Now, the third thing is that do the Jews stand up before the elderly because Mordecai stood not up? And what's the reason for not standing up before Haman? I am a Jew. We're coming to Leviticus chapter 19. Standing up. When an elderly person comes in, it tells us in Leviticus chapter 19, reading from verse 32, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. It was actually commanded. That when an elderly aged person comes to the room, that 
the younger ones, the rest of the people will rise up before that person. We're looking at uh, second, First Kings chapter one. First Kings chapter one. I'm reading from verse nineteen. First Kings chapter one. And we're reading from verse nineteen. In verse uh, chapter two, rather chapter two, reading from verse nineteen. Here is what it says. In verse 19, but she but therefore went unto King Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah. And the king rose up to meet her. He didn't say, I'm sitting on the throne and I'm the number one in Israel. And because of my position, here the mother comes in and the king rose up to meet her and bowed himself unto her. And then he sat down on the throne after showing that respect to the mother and caused his siege to be set for the king's mother. mother. And uh, she sat on the right hand. We're looking at Job chapter 29. Job chapter 29. I read here from verse 8. Job 29 verse 8. The young men saw me and hid themselves. The aged arose and stood up. Job said, they recognize my place, my position, my honor. And when I come in, when I came in, they stood up. Let's come back now to Esther. Esther chapter 8. And we're reading from verses 3 and 4. Esther chapter 8. Reading from verse 3. And Esther spake yet again before the king. And what did she do? Tell me, tell me. Fell down at his feet and besought him with tears to put away the mischief of Amon the Agagite and his device that he had devised against the Jews. And then the king held out the golden scepter toward Esther. So Esther did what? And did what again? Stood before the king. That's Esther, trained and brought up by Mordecai. And she stood up even before the king. How then do we understand why Mordecai said, I am a Jew and I will not bow. I will not do reverence. Neither will I stand up when a man comes in. Mordecai understood that the Amalekites and Mordecai was an Amalekite and Agagite was also an Amalekite, that they were supposed to have been exterminated. And God had given the order that there will be war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. And that God does not regard any Amalekite. And a man happens to be an Amalekite. It was for that reason, he said, I am a Jew. The Jews don't recognize Amalekites. In the sight of God, they don't even exist. They are non-entities. Look at Exodus chapter 17. And we're reading from verse 8. Exodus chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. 
Look at verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will tell me, utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. That was the reason why Mordecai, knowing that Amalekites, Agagites, don't have any remembrance in the sight of God, that's why he said, it's a dead man. It's an unacceptable man. It's a man that he has the hatred himself, but apart from that, there's no remembrance of them. Look at verse 16. For he said, because the Lord had sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek, tell me, from generation to generation, all generations, and Mordecai was in his own generation, and God has war with the Amalekites. I won't bow to him, I won't do him reference. God is fighting him. Deuteronomy chapter 25. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 25, 17. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt. How he met thee by the way and smote the hind part of thee, even all that were feeble be behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Amalek, Amalekites feared not God. Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God has given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt, tell me, blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. In all your generations, all Amalekites and Agag, Agagites or Amalekites, you will not forget this. You won't respect them. You won't honor them. You won't help them. You won't lift them up. You won't exalt them. In the mind of God, all those Amalekites in all their generations, they're destroyed already. That's why. Mordecai said, I won't bow, not because it's wrong for a Jew to bow to a senior person. I won't do him reference, not because it's wrong or idolatrous to bow to somebody who is elderly. And he said, I will not stand up because here is what God had said. We must not forget that's the reason he did what he did. But generally, you see an elderly person and you bow, you respect your husband, you reverence your husband. Somebody comes in and he is higher than you are, maybe in your office or somewhere. You don't, you know, relax and then put your chair in a relaxing, uh, you know, situation or position and say, I am Mordecai. You are not Mordecai. You stand up and respect the people that come in. Do you understand? That clarification was necessary. Now, that's part of rightly dividing the word of truth. And now you second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman as well as a watchman a workman as well as a laborer 
a workman as well as a servant of God, a workman, a preacher, a teacher that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Tonight, as I said, I'm talking to you on strategically developing and reproducing effective, fruitful ministers. Three points we're looking at. Number one, the significance of an effective multiplier. The significance of an effective multiplier. He is a teacher. He multiplies teachers. He is an evangelist. He multiplies evangelists. He is a preacher of the word, a pastor. He trains others. He multiplies preachers and pastors. The significance of an effective multiplier. Point number two. The sacrifice of an enduring minister. The ministry requires endurance, perseverance, patience, and whatever we face in the ministry. There might be opposition, there might be persecution, there might be affliction because of the ministry. We are called to endure the sacrifice of an enduring minister. Point number three, the sanctification of an established messenger. We are messengers carrying a pure gospel from a pure God because of the pure sacrifice of Jesus and we're carrying a pure message to the people who are impure. Our pipeline that gets the water of life to the people must not be polluted, must not be corrupted. It must remain sanctified so that the pure water through the pure pipe into the pure vessel that were put in pure glasses or cups will remain as it ought to remain and then we give to the people and it will turn their lives around and change them. The sanctification of an established messenger. Point number one. What's your number one over there? The significance of an effective multiplier. We're looking at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I read from verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Multiply the faithful ones. Multiply the faithful teachers. Multiply the people you train and then you send to the field. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worries entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that she may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he see not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husband man that laboreth must be forced partaker of the fruits consider what i say and the lord give thee understanding in all things the three things uh, the lord through paul the apostle was telling timothy number one remain an effective minister remain an effective minister don't you ever forget that and are you going to remain an effective minister? Remain a son, faithful son. Remain a teacher, able teacher. Remain a soldier, a good soldier. Remain a disciplined competitor. You're running a race and you're competing. Remain disciplined. 
remain also a profitable, fruitful laborer. You are laboring and you are cultivating. You must remain fruitful. Number six, remain approved workman. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Number seven, remain a sanctified vessel. Number one, remain. Number two, reproduce. Reproduce what you are. You must reproduce. Reproduce faithful sons. You know how to do it. You're a faithful son yourself. So go ahead and everybody that comes under your ministration, reproduce in that person a faithful son. Reproduce able teachers. You're a teacher yourself, a teacher of the word of God. Don't just teach, show them how to teach and reproduce able teachers. You're a good soldier, Timothy. Enduring, you need to remain enduring. Reproduce good soldiers, the people that don't run away from the battlefield and they remain constant and courageous. Reproduce disciplined competitors. The people, they are competing with other people. They are running a race. Tiredness will come. Weariness will come. Sweating will come. Perspiration will come. But you must keep on encouraging them and training them. Reproduce disciplined competitors. Reproduce fruitful laborers. Don't let any of the people that pass on their teaching and training say, What's important is be faithful. It doesn't matter whether I'm fruitful or not. Don't allow them to say that. The Lord said, I have chosen you, I've ordained you, that you may bring forth fruit and that your fruit may remain. Tell them, show them. They shouldn't be satisfied with just a preaching and just laboring. They must be fruitful. Reproduce, approach workmen. Approved workmen center their attention and focus their attention on being approved of God and always tell them they shouldn't mind what people say, they shouldn't mind what people do. Comments or criticisms should not weigh too much with them. You are reproducing people who are looking up to God and all they want is the approval of God alone. Reproduce sanctified vessels. There are so many vessels and some are to honor and some are to dishonor. But the people that pass under your ministry, under your teaching, make sure you are reproducing sanctified vessels. Number one, remain like that yourself. Number two, reproduce other people that will be like that. Number three, refine, refine effective ministers. You hear them teach and they are effective. Don't leave them like that. Refine them. Polish them. Help them to become better. Refine the sons. It's a son. He goes everywhere. Just like I send you and you go. There's somebody like that too. You have confidence in. And you send them anytime. And don't say, I'm tired, I can't do that, I have my excuses, I have my reasons not to do that. You always do that. Remain like that yourself. Reproduce such people and refine them. You see the able teacher there, he takes the word of God and line upon line, precept upon precepts. He teaches clearly. He teaches effectively. Don't just leave him like that. Make him better. Refine those able teachers. You find people, they endure. And you hear there are difficulties and challenges in their region, in their state, in their local government, in their district, in their group. And yet, they keep on. They will not give up. 
challenges are there and then you ask them what happened last monday i heard there were challenges in your area were you able to get to the bible study and all those members were they there oh it's your replies and it says were well, even more last monday than before how did they do that we have taught our people whatever is happening now god will protect them and so if they have to come through any kind of a blockage if they have to come through any kind of barrier they know that they always have to be there they're soldiers soldiers of the cross and they're good soldiers and we're refining them refine them they are disciplined competitors they're running the race and every sin and any sin that will hinder them from running the race to a good finishing they're going to push aside keep on like that but refine them those laborers they're laboring they're cultivating they're winning converts they're discipling converts make sure that you yourself you keep on doing that not only that you're reproducing many of them and then you're refining them approved workmen you can tell the Spirit of God bears witness in your heart. That is an approved workman. That is an approved watchman. That is an approved preacher of the word. But even though you have that confidence and you have that witness, don't leave them like that. Refine them, the sanctified vessels. You see them. And the Spirit of God bears witness in your heart this one has made up his mind he got sanctified he remains sanctified and nothing will corrupt him you see those vessels like that sanctified vessels refine them remain such a minister reproduce such ministers and refine them too number one faithful sons we're coming to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I read from verse 19. Philippians chapter 2 verse 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you. That I also may be of good comfort when i know your state for i have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state for all seek their own not the things which belong to christ which are jesus christ but ye know the proof of him that as a son with the father he has served with me in the gospel remain like that reproduce such people refine such faithful sons able teachers he wants us to teach and he wants us to be capable teachers capable teachers how do you know a capable teacher an able teacher colossians chapter 1 reading from verse 28 Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That's the goal. If you have taught um, in a primary school before, or maybe junior secondary, and if you had written notes of lesson, in a notes of lesson, when I taught in the primary and secondary, we were right. This is the topic, and this is where we're taking our teaching for that day from the textbook, and then the goal and the purpose. At the end of this lesson today, we would have achieved this purpose and this goal and that's what we're still to do that we want to perfect the saints we want to get them ready prepared for heaven and because you have that goal 
you keep to that goal number three good soldiers remain a good soldier not only that reproduce good soldiers not only that refine and perfect the good soldiers in second timothy chapter 2 verse 3 now therefore endure hardness there's sadness in the ministry there's resistance something sometimes against the minister a good soldier will not turn his face the other way hey there's danger there there's problem there there's resistance there it looks like some people are making fire and it's going to be hot for me that's why you are there remain a soldier reproduce soldiers and refine the soldiers thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of jesus christ no man that worries ministry is warfare you're fighting against sin you're fighting against satan you're fighting against the rigidity of sinners that will not repent it's warfare it's on the, you're on the battlefield no man that worries entangles himself with the affairs of this life don't get involved with the politics of the land don't get involved with the politics of denominations you'll not get involved and get entangled with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier and then as you look at verse 5 if a man also strive for masteries yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully striving lawfully let's come to first corinthians chapter 9 reading from verse 25 first corinthians chapter 9 reading from verse 25 it says in verse 25 and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things temperate controlled subdued in all things now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown but we an incorruptible i therefore so run not as uncertainly so fight i not as one that beateth the air but i keep my body under are you an apostle keep your body under a preacher keep your body under are you a pastor keep your body under are you a laborer in the vineyard of the lord it says i keep under my body and bring it into subjection and bring it into subjection don't let other people control members of your body control your hand control your feet control your eyes control your thoughts do that yourself you are now an adult you are now a preacher you are now a pastor there are many people that may not control themselves but they want to control you don't allow that to happen there are many people that may not be preaching you are the one preaching they want to control what you say and what you don't say don't allow that to happen come under the control of the holy ghost yourself and bring yourself under and if you are self-disciplined another person will not have to discipline you if you are self-controlled another person or group of people will not have to control you if you have to do the right thing because there is a remote control somewhere you are not capable yet be matured and remain a person who is disciplined and reproduce people who are disciplined and refine people who are disciplined but i keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when i have preached to others i myself should be a castaway you will not be a castaway 
and then you must remain fruitful laborers. You are laboring. And it says in verse 6, the husband man that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You talk about salvation, experience it yourself. You preach sanctification, experience it yourself. You preach the baptism, immersion in the Holy Ghost, the power of the Holy Ghost, experience it yourself. You preach love, experience it yourself. You preach endurance, perseverance, experience it yourself. The man that laboreth, he says, the husband man that laboreth must be forced partaker of the fruits. You'll be a partaker. You are partakers already in Jesus' name. In Paul's Corinthians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Osman man that laboreth. We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For all the foundation can no man lay than that is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, and the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Only one condition. If the work of the laborer, the preacher, the pastor, the evangelist, if that work remains until the end, and those converts get to heaven, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. We must be approved workmen. Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 15. Study. Study. Endeavor. Try your very best. School yourself. Discipline yourself. Apply yourself to learning. Study. To show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth the Lord will help us you will be approved in Jesus name second Corinthians chapter 10 second Corinthians chapter 10 I read from verse 12 in verse 12, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. There are people, whatever they're doing for the Lord, they compare themselves with other people. I'm as good as so and so. I'm not doing bad. I'm better than so and so. I don't think I'm doing too terribly bad my location my district my local church is even growing more than the other fellows location or local church it says we dare not make ourselves of the number 
or compare ourselves with some that commend, praise, exalt themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. The approval of man is nothing. The criticism of people, nothing. And the commendation of people, nothing. He wants you to make the comparison with what God has called you to do. Look at verse 18. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Whom the Lord commendeth. And God knows when you've given your best. He knows when you have prepared very well. He knows when you have thought in love, in grace, of the people you're teaching. And he knows that you want to do anything and everything to be the best to the congregation. And then you are approved of God, sanctified vessels. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure, holy, sanctified heart. That sanctification comes as a result of our yielding ourselves totally unto the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 4. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 4, that every one of you, whatever your area of work, that every one of you, whatever situation you find yourself, in your local church that every one of you whatever your peculiar trial or temptation that every one of you whatever your weakness in the past but now that you say you are you are a sanctified vessel that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor god give us wisdom to do that effectively in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. As it concerns remaining effective, reproducing effective ministers, and being an effective multiplier, and refining the people the Lord has given you to train, to disciple, to build up. Look at verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. The Lord give you understanding. The Lord give you wisdom. The Lord give you everything you need to be an effective multiplier in Jesus' name. Point number two, the sacrifice of an enduring minister. The sacrifice of an enduring minister. Look at chapter two, reading from verse eight. Second Timothy chapter two, verse eight. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble. Wherein I, Paul the Apostle, I suffer trouble. Wherein I, Pastor, suffer trouble. You must ask yourself, has the ministry made you to suffer? 
your responsibility have you suffered and your calling have you suffered and have you endured are you sacrificially doing the work or anytime there's a little headache anytime there's a little stomach problem anytime there's a little resistance anytime there's a little opposition you say oh, well i don't i'm not cut out for that i didn't know that that's what pastoral work entails I didn't know that, you know, a rich you know, of a seer will have to go through this. I never thought of this in my life. I think uh, whatever the people want, let them go ahead with it. I'm not going to fight or contain for anything. You know? This headache must go. That's the most important to me. The situation of the people, the upliftment of the people, the exaltation of the doctrine of the word of God and the preaching of the pure gospel and enduring the temptation, the trial, the difficulty, the opposition. Ah, that one is not, that's not my own Lord. I am here to be happy. I'm here to be joyful. I'm not here to face any kind of difficulty. You are not fully in the ministry yet. Look at verse 8, verse 9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. That word of God will flow freely. Look at verse 9. Therefore, I endure all things. I don't even know what direction those things will come from today but whatever direction i endure all things why for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in christ jesus with eternal glory it says that's my desire to be an effective multiplier each of us must be an enduring minister. Each one has some real contradiction of sinners, contradiction of Satan to resist, to endure, to overcome, and to conquer. You will conquer. Number one, the endurance of a son. The endurance of a son. If you are a real son, it will show how you endure. It says unto Timothy, my dearly beloved son, be strong in the grace of God, in the might and the power of God. If you are a son, there is something for a son to endure. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. Sons have what they have to endure. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he? whom the father chastineth not. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have urged fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's why he corrects. That's why he convicts. And then if we confess and go to him with a soft, submissive heart, he cleanses and make us, makes us partakers of his holiness. Number two, 
the endurance of a teacher the endurance of a teacher a teacher has to endure the students may not get it the first time and the students may not have the attitude you're expecting students should have and the disciples and the compass were training may not have the attitude they ought to have you don't give up there's the endurance of a teacher in second timothy chapter 1 verse 11 second timothy chapter 1 verse 11 whereunto i am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the gentiles i am appointed a teacher of the gentiles for which cause i also suffer i'm appointed a teacher and for that cause of being appointed as a teacher for that cause i also suffer these things nevertheless i am not ashamed for i know whom i have believed and i'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which have committed unto him against that day. Chapter 2, verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. There's also the endurance of a good soldier. You're called to be a soldier, and you're going to be a good soldier. There's something to endure. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. That therefore endure hardness. Sometimes the road is rough. Sometimes the climate is harsh. Sometimes the territory you are trying to defend is vulnerable and there are areas that have crashed and you are supposed to still be a good soldier and protect. Sometimes contending for the faith was delivered unto the saints. Like a soldier, it's not as easy as it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Whatever the new challenge, it says that therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worries entangles himself with the fears of this life. There are many things you'll have to shed up. There are many invitations to political life you'll have to give up. There are many things in the commercial life you'll have to give up because if you take them on, it will hinder and make you less effective in what you have called, what you are called to bear and to defend. Verse 4, no man that worries and tangles himself or the affairs of this life. You will know when to say no and what to say no to. That will bring entanglement. I can't do that. That will get me off my platform, my calling. I cannot do that. That will distract me and sway me off. I cannot do that. That he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. There's the endurance while striving for the mastery. Enduring while striving for the mastery. If you want, if you want to master your calling, master a subject, and master a kind of uh, duty that the Lord has given you, there is what you will have to endure. You know, even reading the Bible will take some endurance. Even checking up, what does that mean? What does that mean? Will take some endurance that you will not allow tiredness and then after you have spent hours and hours and hours preparing to deliver the message sometimes it will take some endurance you have to be strong strong in your mind 
strong with a backbone and strong against any sin and every sin that will not allow you to say everything that Lord has commanded you to say. It takes endurance if you are striving for the mastery. You will endure. I will endure. I said I will endure. I will endure in Jesus' name. You know, you know, go to the a kind of behind the curtain and be crying. Lord, you called me. And Lord, you appointed me. And you gave me this work to do. And I'm trying to be my best. But what to endure is so much. Don't be a baby. Don't be a coward. Rise up and endure. And the Lord will give you the grace. I'm waiting for a good day. Amen. That's us in Peter, First Peter chapter 2. I read from verse 19. First Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering, wrong, wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well, when ye preach well, when ye pray well, when ye minister well, when ye give well, when ye train well, when ye develop other people so well, and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. To make us believers, he suffered. To make us workers, he suffered. To grant us the power of the Holy Ghost, he suffered. And to make us men, able men, faithful, able to teach others also, he suffered. He had to go to the cross to make that possible for you and for me. And he has left us an example that we should follow his steps. There's the endurance of the laborers. Endurance of the laborers. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 3. And I read from verse 11. Second Timothy chapter 3. We're reading from verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. He will deliver you. Yea, verse 12, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learnt, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learnt them. I will continue. I said I will continue. Number six is the endurance of a workman. The endurance of a workman. You're working at evangelization, something to endure. Working at being a pastor, there's something to endure. The endurance of a workman. Second Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 2. Preach the word. Be instant in season. Out of season. Reprove. Rebuke. Exhort without long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heed to themselves teachers 
having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist be full proof of thy ministry. There's something to endure if you're going to be an evangelist, if you're going to be a pastor, if you're going to be a teacher, there's something to endure in the ministry. Endurance of servants. Endurance of servants. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's the servant of God. God said, Moses, my servant. He saw Pharaoh, didn't look at Pharaoh. Saw those magicians, didn't think about them. He saw the chariots of Egypt, didn't think about them. He was looking at the one who had appointed him. And he endured as seeing him who is invisible. If you are looking too much at your persecutors, and you are trying to gauge their strength, measure their ability, look at their conspiracy, and look at the continuity of their persecution, you'll get tired. When you look away from all those opposers and all those people that do not want you to succeed in ministry, and you're looking at God as seeing Him who is invisible, you will overcome. You will succeed. And the work will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the sanctification of an established messenger. We're coming to Second Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone, how many people? I said how many of us? Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. For in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver and also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the name on the, on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish, unlearned questions avoid, knowing that the two gender strives and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. God's established sons, God's established servants need to be sanctified and maintain the sanctified experience 
and we need to examine ourselves. How do we examine ourselves to find out what the Lord has done and now we're keeping what the Lord has done. God's established sons and servants, number one, will depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. Did you see that in verse 19? And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52, I'm reading here from verse 11. In verse 11, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from this, touch no unclean thing, go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean, the bear the vessel of the Lord, you'll depart from iniquity. There are such people as sanctified and submissive for the master's use. Sanctified, free from sin, internal sin, external sin, habitual sin, common sin, occasional sin, such sanctified vessels, sanctified servants and sons, ministers, messengers, preachers of the word, they remain pure. We're looking at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, verse 3. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous, as Christ is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God, tell me, does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Such sons and servants who are established in sanctification flee from youthful Losts. They flee from youthful loss. We're looking at verse 22. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful losts. Flee also youthful loss. Don't just stay there. If you're ready, be sucked in into that pollution, sucked in into that corruption flee take to your feet first peter chapter 2 verse 11 in first peter chapter 2 verse 11 dearly beloved i beseech you as strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul that's pollution, corruption, defilement. Once you repossess your soul, it will not happen in Jesus' name. But then you must abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We'll come back to Second Timothy chapter 2, the second part of verse 22. It tells you what to follow what to pursue, what to possess, what to retain. Verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow, pursue, possess, embrace, and keep righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Hebrews 
chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace, pursue peace, embrace peace, possess peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Come back to Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, avoid all things that bring strife. Don't start strife. And if it has started, don't put petrol, foil on the strife and make the fire blaze abroad. Whatever you can do, quench it, stop it. And don't get involved in anything that brings strife. Verse 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 3, Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 3, let nothing be done through strife of inglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Come back to Second Timothy. Second Timothy. Chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Such sons were established in sanctification, servants were established in sanctification, are meek and gentle unto all men. Meek and gentle unto all men. Verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. But be gentle unto all men. Gentle unto how many people? Let me hear you. you know, there are some men in your districts, your local church. They're difficult to go a long ways. They're difficult to lift up. It's like thorns. You almost have to have gloves in your hand before you can pick up those thorns. And you're thinking, how can I be gentle to these? If you are sanctified, if you're obedient to the word of God, is the Lord's command, it is possible. I said it is possible. So when a pastor says, I've lost my patience, it's gone astray. I've lost my gentleness, I've lost my love, I've lost my whatever, meekness, before these people, they just provoke you to be angry. No, not if you're obeying the word of God. Look at verse 24 again. And the servant of the Lord, tell me out aloud, I cannot hear you, must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach you still have aptitude to teach and patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves a peradventure god will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth sanctified sons established servants depart from iniquity they are sanctified and submissive for the master's use. They flee youthful lusts. They follow righteousness and peace. They avoid all things that bring strife. They are meek and gentle unto all men. They call captives to repentance. They will not stop. They call captives, those who have been captured by Satan 
and captured by besetting sin. He called them to repentance. Verse 25, verse 26. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. The Lord has revealed to us today how we ought to develop and reproduce effective and fruitful ministers. He wants us to remain pure and sanctified. And he wants us to reproduce such people who are faithful. He wants us to endure. He wants us to sacrifice. He wants us to be who we ought to be. So the work of God can prosper in our hands. More than that, and above each all, he wants us to remain sanctified. Established in the truth. Established in purity and holiness. So that this work will prosper in our hands. The work will prosper in your hand. I said the work will prosper in your hand. Am I hearing an amen? amen? Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. And you tell the Lord, Oh Lord, everything I've heard today, I want this word to be reproduced, to be reflected in my life. He will do it. I said you will do it. Open your mouth and pray unto the Lord and let there be reproduction even from tonight.